Hey guys, let's get started. Last time, Fritz got a permit to make a garden and they kept tunneling. Goethe thinks maybe Anna's ready to be friends again, but she's not sure. She decides to steal a pulley to help them remove dirt from the welcome building quicker. All right, so I think now, Anna, I'm sorry, Goethe's gonna go out and try to get this pulley. Um, right off the bat, we have a word, accused. Accused means to say that somebody else did something wrong, okay? Let's start. I didn't tell Fritz my plan. Not only would he have accused me of every kind of stupidity, but he also would have been right to do it. However, he couldn't feel the aches in my body every night after hauling up those buckets. Hauling meaning pulling, like heavy work. It wasn't just my arms or shoulders. Every part of me was exhausted and sore. Each morning, I started more tired and it ended more drained. I was carrying lighter loads than when we first began and fewer of them. If something didn't change by the end of the week, Fritz would be doing all the work while I sat aside, useless as the growing piles of dirt. Police regularly patrolled the streets after my curfew, but as young as I was, if they caught me, probably the worst thing to happen would be a ride home in their car with a slapped hand and another page for my file. Probably. Unless I had already stolen the pulley by then, which would be impossible to explain. It would, be, it would be reported to the Stasi, who would wonder what a 12-year-old girl wanted with such a tool. They would find the tunnel, and we had gone too far for me to pretend Fritz, had, Fritz hadn't been involved. So it was decided then, I couldn't get caught. It was very early on a rainy Saturday morning when I snuck out of the apartment. My plan was to get the pulley before everyone, anyone else was allowed outside, and to be on my way home immediately after curfew was lifted. That way, I only had to sneak around in one direction. I wore my blandest clothes, which really only required a, a choice between communist gray and communist grayer. They would camouflage me against the walls in the early morning light. I also brought a small burlap sack and our sharpest kitchen knife. As soon as I got out onto the street, a turbant cubel drove by, full of police, and I backed into the shadows of our doorway. The officers' rifles reflected from the street lights, and their shared laughter was coarse, and louder than it ought to be for this early hour. Louder than it ever ought to be, actually. I wonder what men like that might, like them might find funny. Probably we had different senses of humor, because nothing about our police force ever made me smile. For several long minutes after they'd left, I fought against my instinct to go back inside. That would have been the smart thing to do. Then I reminded myself that tunneling beneath the death strip was hardly a smart act, so at least I was being consistent. After they could no longer be heard, I made myself take the first step onto the sidewalk, and after that I was committed. The streets were quieter than I'd ever seen them, and it felt as though the entire city had been abandoned, meaning no one there. This is probably what my neighborhood would have, come, would have become if the Berlin Wall hadn't gone up. We would have left, and Herr Kraus too. A family who lived below us also had plans to leave once. I was sure there were others. Eventually, the whole city would have emptied out except for the most loyal party officials and the Stasi and Grenzer officers. Or what did I know? Maybe they would have left too, given the chance. Russia's new first secretary, Brezhnev, would have rolled through here on a tour from Moscow and found out he was the leader of a vast country of empty buildings and overgrown farmland. I balled up my courage and my fists along with it, rounding the safety of the corner while keeping as close to the shadows and coves as possible. I saw nobody, heard nobody, and as far as I could tell, I was completely alone out there. The next part of my walk was the most dangerous. I had to dart across a street that was usually quite busy in the daytime. The rain would help, but it wasn't falling hard enough for a full camouflage. And even at a full sprint, it would take me two or three seconds to cross this wide street. I stayed hidden at the corner for several minutes, stealing my nerves. Even though the heavy clouds, even through the heavy clouds, the sky was already growing lighter. I had to run. If I didn't go now, then curfew would end and I would be stuck here with no hope of getting that pulley. I refused to haul dirt buckets up that ladder again, not when a much better option was within my reach. That single thought was enough to prompt me into moving. I gave one last look in every direction and then ran. Ran like I never had before. I was blind to everything but the corner in front of me and the protection it would offer. My feet were light upon the street and I jumped the curb so that there would be no chance of tripping. Then I lunged for the cove of the nearest building as if fire was at my heels. I landed in there and almost screamed. A woman was already using that same cove to hide, and I looked startled, and looked as startled to see me as I was to see her. Her silky long hair was as dark as her sleek outfit, 
but pulled behind her in a fashion more elegant than I usually saw. She was beautiful, but had clearly tried to play it down by wearing only a bare amount of makeup. I felt clumsy and plain beside her, and would have left right away if I had anywhere better to go. Her face softened as she looked at me. I know you. Aldous Lowe's daughter, right? It bothered me that she should know that, especially since I was certain I did not know her. She only smiled and said, It looks like you're no better at staying out of trouble than he was. But your father was a very inspirational man. He meant a lot to those of us who wanted to see things changed here in the East. She spoke of him like he was dead, the same way my mother often did, something I always resented. We've heard this word before, but resent or resentment um, is a way of saying that you're bitter um, or it makes you feel a little bit angry or a deep emotion of like just annoyed with someone else. Getting no reaction from me, the woman said, it's not safe to be out here this time of night. She reached into her pocket and pulled out five Ostmarks. Could you use this? Frankly, I was so relieved that she didn't demand a bribe of silence from me. I barely even thought about the fact that I was the one receiving the bribe. So the bri a bribe meaning like giving someone something to get something in return. She smiled when I nodded and pressed the money into my hand and then added, shall we agree not to have seen each other then? Agreed, I mumbled. And she ran off the way I had just come while I darted in the other direction. My mind burned with curiosity for who that woman was and how she knew my father. But there was a much stronger urge for me to get to that pulley. The sun was rising fast. I didn't have much time. About 15 minutes later, I reached the neighborhood with the pulley. Since it was a weekend, several of the stores would be closed today and I had some time before the rest opened. Many of the residents here would have already left for the countryside, drowning their troubles in a bottle of Pilsner. I hoped those who remained were sleeping in late. I breathed a little easier once I was in the lot with the damaged building. There were plenty of places to hide, and based on the scattered garbage I passed, other people had hidden here before me. I had to stack a couple of cinder blocks on their ends to stand up high enough to reach the pulley, but after checking the area carefully to be sure I was still alone, I reached up with my knife, sawed off the rope, and let the pulley drop to the ground. I jumped down, hid it in my burlap sack, and crouched behind the rubble in the lot until the first signs of traffic grew around me. It was an easy walk home, but as soon as I rounded the last corner, I saw Fritz waiting for me on the street. His face was nearly purple, and his breasts were harsh and shallow. He grabbed my shirt collar and yanked me inside the apartment building, then twisted me around. What were you thinking? He hissed. My chest tightened as I got ready for the argument that was clearly coming. I had no need being angry when he learned I was gone, especially that I went alone, but my reasons were good. If he wanted to fight about this, we would, but I would win. We needed something and I got it, I said. Nothing is worth what you did. How dare you, Goethe? So, does Fritz think this was a worthwhile risk? Why does he say that nothing is worth what you did? Do you agree with him? I started to retort, but quickly lost any interest in arguing. Now that I really looked at him, it wasn't anger in his eyes, it was fear. More than I'd ever seen in my brother before. I opened the burlap sack just enough for him to see what was inside, and then when I did, he nodded and tears streamed down his cheeks. He grabbed me into a hug, his stiff fingers digging into my back to communicate the worries still trapped inside him. He whispered, that was too stupid to count as bravery. What if we lost you? Never do that again, Goethe. Never do anything like that again. I gave him an apology, but only for making him so afraid. I could never regret what I'd done, because now we had a pulley. Okay, take a break if you need it. Pause and come back. And we're going to move on to chapter 25. Okay. Thankfully, the rain had stopped by the time we left for the welcome building. On the way there, Fritz and I stopped by a market and bought five Osmarks worth of rope and also a little food we could eat while walking on the working on the tunnel. When he asked where the money had come from, I asked my own question instead. How involved was Papa in the resistance? Was he only talking to those who were fighting or were there more? Fritz frowned. Why are you asking that now? Because I already knew the answer and needed him to confirm. Maybe my father hadn't led any marches or put up protest flyers, but that woman last night knew his name and knew him well enough to recognize me after at least four years. There had to be reasons for that. 
As we walked, Fritz said, Father promised Mother he wouldn't break any laws, but he bent that promise as far as he could. I know he spent a lot of time next door with Herr Krauss, helping him build support against the government. They used to hold meetings there, one so secret he denied that they had ever happened, even after I told him that I could hear them through my bedroom wall. Why do you ask? Last night I met someone he used to know, I simply said, which reminded him that he hadn't scolded me for a while. But even as angry as he still was, I'd also gotten him to admit the pulley was was invaluable. He thought it would only take a few pieces of wood and the rope to get it working. Fritz grabbed some old wooden slats from the same lot where I'd stolen the pulley and bundled them with our garden tools to carry them into the garden. Once it was safe to bring everything into the basement, he stood the longest two pieces of wood on their ends and attached them at the top with a third piece of wood. He built stands for the base and said I would have to anchor them with my weight while I pulled the bucket up or else the whole thing would tip over on me. I wish I could make it more permanent, he said, but I think we should lay this down flat each night so it doesn't draw any attention in case someone does peek in the windows. I attached the pulley at the top and ran the rope through, me, through it. The other end was already tied to the bucket beside me. When I pulled down on the rope, the bucket handle lifted up. Let's test it, I said, already anticipating how helpful this was going to be. Fritz climbed into the shelter and I lowered the bucket beside him. He filled it with dirt and then told me to raise it up. Even though it was heavier than the buckets I usually hauled up the ladder, the pulley bore most of the weight and took less of my effort than before. I raised the bucket up to eye level, then dumped it on the basement floor beside me and lowered it again. Well, I wonder if Fritz thinks it was worth the risk now. Fritz and I worked this way until he announced all the extra dirt was gone from the shelter. He suggested he could go to work digging while I got rid of the dirt in the basement, so I did. I first lowered the pulley system, untied the bucket, and emptied the new dirt from the basement out into the garden patch. The work seemed much easier today, maybe because I wasn't already exhausted from hauling it up and down the ladder. Only an hour of work easily convinced me that I had done the right thing by sneaking out to get the pulley. By midday, the extra dirt was mostly gone from the basement and spread out in the garden area. Fritz would have had more dirt after lunch, but for now, I decided to work outside to make it look as if we were progressing in the garden. I was accustomed to the constant city noises in Berlin, but here, set off so far from any main roads, it was very quiet. So it was easy to detect the footsteps of someone arriving from the alley, the same way I had come when I first found this building. I took a quick glance back to make sure the boards were covering the window, they are, though I already knew they were. Fritz and I were very careful to always remember that, and I knew he wouldn't come out unless he was sure nobody else was around. So I turned back to my work and tried not to appear too concerned. Any look of guilt or stress would certainly give me away, because if my only purpose here was gardening, I was allowed to be here. But who I saw emerge from the alley confused me. It was Anna. Her mother was with her, carrying a basket covered with cloth. Mama thought she saw you working here, Anna said cheerfully. After seeing you at the restaurant yesterday, we walked this way home and thought something looked different here. I stopped working and stared up at her while shielding my eyes from the sun at her back. She was smiling and acting friendly as always, the same Anna she'd been before her brother's death. Or almost the same. Something seemed different and I couldn't quite place it. It was like she was too friendly, working too hard to pretend everything was normal. It probably wasn't much different than I had acted on our last day of school together when I first told her about this garden. So I wanted, to, uh, I wanted you to think about this part. It sounds like Goethe's kind of remembering a time when she wasn't being very honest with Anna. She was just trying to get her to be friends with her again so she could get something. And now Goethe's thinking maybe Anna's doing the same thing. Is that what's making her suspicious of Anna? Mm -hmm. Does she kind of see herself in her? And do you think she has a reason not to trust Anna right now? Maybe she felt as awkward as I did about repairing our friendship. After Peter's accident, Frau Warner chose her words carefully. Maybe she wanted everyone to believe that escaping one's country by hiding out in a specially designed car was an accident. Or more likely, that's how the Stasi had told her to describe it. You, bought us, you brought us some bread from your mother. That was so kind and we never thanked her. I sat back on my heels. My mother had to leave town to take care of my grandmother. Yes, I heard that, Frau Warner casually looked around. We wondered if there's anything you and your brother might need while she's gone. Where is Fritz, by the way? I thought he was helping you garden. He had to run an errand, I said. He might not be back for a while. 
She just accepted my lie, as I had told it, without batting an eye. Ah, well, please tell him hello for me. I know he and Peter were friends, and it would have been nice to see him too. Is there some place I could set this basket? It has cheese and crackers and some homemade shortbread. I thought you might like that until your mother's home to cook again. It all sounded delicious. So good, in fact, that I'd have snatched the basket off her arm and inhaled the food from my filthy fingers if I didn't think it would draw some unwanted attention my way. Instead, I pointed to a flattened rock near the pond. You could put it there, and thank you. The gratitude I felt could not be expressed enough with words. If only she knew how much the food meant to us. While their mother walked over with the basket, Anna crouched near me. I returned to working on some weeds, but that didn't stop her from talking. In a low voice, she said, On the last day of school, when you sat by me at lunch, I know you were just trying to be nice, and I was horrible in response. I want you to know I'm sorry about that. I looked up. I'm sorry, too, for not telling you about Peter's plans as soon as I heard. Maybe if I'd told you sooner. That wasn't your fault. Tears filled her eyes, but she blinked them away. Mama thinks it would be good for me to get out of the apartment more, so if you'd like, I could come by sometime and help here in the garden. Actually, I didn't like that idea at all. But how could I refuse Anna's polite offer without raising suspicions? I smiled as kindly as I could manage. It's hot and you'll get fil filthy and it's boring, but if you really want to, thank you, Goethe. She seemed genuinely happy about what little I had offered, which made me wish it could have been possible. I know a lot about gardens. I can be helpful and we can fix some of your mistakes before we get the seeds planted. My eyes narrowed. What mistakes? Even in my fake garden, I felt slighted by her suggestion that I might have done a poor job. She chuckled. Well, you can't just cover the weeds over with dirt, silly. I don't know where you got this dirt from, but it won't fix the problem for long. Pretty soon, the weeds will just pop up through the new dirt, stronger than ever. I didn't answer her. Instead, I glared, which I shouldn't have done. But she had no idea how hard I'd work and how important it was that I got rid of our extra dirt. If I couldn't figure out that problem, we would surely be caught. I wasn't angry at her, just frustrated with myself. But all I could do was let her walk away. After I was sure she and her mother had left, I made my way back inside the building where Fritz had been watching us. I heard it all, he said, even before I could say a word. Maybe the next rainstorm will even the fresh dirt out with the old, I suggested. We got some rain last night and nothing improved, Fritz said. Whether we cover the weeds or bare ground, it still looks like fresh dirt. We can't use it out here anymore. He was right. We would have to do the hard work of removing the weeds, which was bad enough, but the second problem was even harder. What would we do with all the extra dirt? Well, the bigger problem is, what are they gonna do about Anna joining them for gardening? How are they gonna still work on their tunnel while she's there? And they're never gonna know when she's gonna show up. What do you think they're gonna do? Hmm? All right, see you next time.